Hi everybody, I am recording a new book vlog on a book that I read called Alexander Hamilton by Ron Chernow. This is a terrifically well-written, very authoritative book on the life of Alexander Hamilton, and I really strongly recommend that you read this if you're really interested in this early period of Federalist, early Federalist history in the United States, or in the period of constitutional history and the constitutional foundings in this country. This book is a fascinating read because it looks at Hamilton's life and examines it in a way that sometimes other books that might mention Hamilton, but it's because it's not as in-depth, it doesn't really give you the sense of a fuller picture of who he is. Sometimes Hamilton can come across as being um, pretty partisan, sometimes a little bit petty and bitter. Sometimes he comes across being very brilliant, but rarely do you see a book where he is fairly portrayed equally as a whole person uh, in all of these different aspects of his life. In many ways, yes, he was brilliant, he was petty, he was partisan um, and flawed, but he also was a great American and a great thinker of his time as well, and I think Chernow does a nice job of capturing that in his terrific book. Hamilton was a man who started off early in his career by becoming an officer in the Revolutionary War fighting for the in the Continental Army, and he became um, known to George Washington as a result of that, and Washington then invited him to work on his staff to, uh, to assist him during the war. And so Hamilton spent several years working with Washington, I think about five years. And it was in that time that they formed a very strong bond and political partnership, if you will, in working with the, the cause of the American Revolution. And it was in that time that Hamilton formed a lot of his views about what government should be and could be based on the relationship that he had and that Washington had with the U.S. Continental Congress in terms of how it would work in funding and supporting the army and the revolutionary cause uh, which was always very, very difficult and, and very tenuous at best. So this helped to form a lot of Hamilton's views that government needed to have a strong central government, that the Congress needed to have more power, and that there needed to be a strong executive figure in the country. Hamilton also, because he was not born in the United States, he was born in the Caribbean, and because he was an immigrant, in essence, to this country, he didn't have, perhaps, the strong ties to any specific colony, later states, and so he didn't see himself as being a New Yorker, exactly. Even though he had settled in New York, I think he viewed himself more as an American, which made him a unique figure, somewhat, in U.S history at that time, because most figures would have seen themselves as being part of their country. For example, George Washington has somewhat felt that way as a Virginian. Definitely, uh, I think Jefferson, Madison, they felt themselves as being uh, Virginians rather than being a American first. Uh, Washington, perhaps not quite as much so. He was probably one of the best-traveled presidents uh, of his era in term, or politicians period of his era, because he had traveled to all of the different colonies, whereas other presidents often didn't do that. So anyway, with Hamilton, uh, he, while he was not particularly well traveled, I think he viewed himself as a big picture thinker and saw the importance of having a strong federal government and a strong executive figure. When Washington uh, was finally selected to be the president in uh, 1787 when he took office, Hamilton then was a very strong and obvious choice to become 
uh, a key figure within Washington's administration. Washington asked Hamilton to become the Secretary of the Treasury, and he was the second choice, actually, of Washington, but the first choice had turned Washington down, and so Hamilton did accept, uh, and he made a lasting impact on the country and in terms of what the country would evolve into in that time period. It was such a critical era because the U.S. government was so new under the Constitution that while people had thought about the philosophical side of what the government might look like, it hadn't really come up with the practical part of it yet, because it wasn't in practice exactly under the Constitution. And so Hamilton helped to give flesh out and give shape to that government. So it really, he was a critical figure, and in my view, perhaps the most critical figure in that early federal period. Certainly, Washington uh, was very important. John Adams was very important as the vice president, and also as was Thomas Jefferson. But those people were not, and James Madison as well as a congressional leader. But in my view, Hamilton was the quintessential figure of that time period, and what his views were helped to shape what was later to become for the country and the government and how it ran. He was well prepared for this because even when the Constitution was being debated after it was originally written and hadn't yet been ratified by the various states, he, along with James Madison and John Jay, wrote a number of important pieces called the Federalist Papers. And those papers helped to persuade people about the importance of supporting and accepting and ratifying the U.S. Constitution. He wrote the majority of those papers and or the articles within the uh, Federalist Papers and uh, certainly he had thought perhaps more than any other man in the United States at that time about the importance of what the Constitution would mean for the country. So he was really very well prepared when he took office then under uh, the Washington administration and became the Secretary of Treasury, he had really thought about these issues deeply and what was needed for a country to be able to run well as a democracy and to run well with a strong federal government. He helped to create a number of different plans to make sure that that could take place. For example, creating a Bank of the United States um, he helped to centralize debt from all of the different states under the U.S. federal government instead so that uh, individual states wouldn't be burdened with that. He helped to create an image, a view more of the U.S. as being a more uh, mercantile or um, merchant-based system economy rather than being an agrarian farmer type of an economy. And he saw the value and importance of industry in this country, not to say that he didn't support farming or, or the rural type of lifestyle, but he saw the value of the urban lifestyle and of the industrial merchant classes as something that was new that would really give economic power to the United States. That was quite prescient of him because in forward thinking because that was not the way the U.S. was at that time. It had been an agrarian society where the vast majority of people were farmers and lived in rural communities, and that was a very big difference in the way that he saw things. His view, in part, helped to shape the coming of political parties being formed in the United States. Uh, because of him, and his views that he put forward that had to be debated in Congress for potential legislative action to be taken, there was an opposition that formed to him under the Republicans that was led largely by Thomas Jefferson and by James Madison. And this Republican Party formed, and so here you have Hamilton as the leader of his group of people that support him, his views, which became known as the Federalists, and then you had 
the Republicans. So that's our two-party system is formed directly as a result of the ideas that Hamilton had and tried to put forth under his time as the Secretary of the Treasury. Amazing the amount of things that he was able to accomplish. He was truly, I think, a, a gifted and a brilliant um, politician in that regard. But he also was a flawed man. He had a wife and ultimately, I believe they had six children that survived to adulthood. Uh, he loved his wife, but at one point he did have an extramarital relations with another woman that probably uh, was a thing that was cooked up between this woman and her husband. So uh, he, Hamilton ended up having to pay a number of bribes, if you will, to the husband and essentially to the woman for them to keep quiet about the affair. And uh, ultimately it came out, it was revealed, uh, in part through Hamilton, his own doing, because he had told some different people in the Republican Congress who had come to him and said, look, what's going on? We hear these rumors. And he admitted that he had indeed had an affair, and he gave some letters to uh, some of the, one of these people, which was Jane, uh, to, uh, which was uh, Monroe, James Monroe, who later became president of the United States. And Monroe gave those letters then to a friend of his, who then published them. And so it became public knowledge that Hamilton had had an affair, and this really kind of ruined his credibility among people in his party and, and among those in government. Ironically, it didn't really destroy his relationship with his wife, who was a steadfast supporter of Hamilton long after Hamilton had died, and she died when she was in her 90s, and she really wanted to see that his uh, views and his role in society was perpetuated in, in a way that she felt really honored him. So that was a testament to her. Hamilton... Uh, left office as the Secretary of the Treasury, not because of his affair or the scandal of that, but because he was just ready to leave office and uh, pursue his own life. And when he did, he still was very heavily involved in politics. He was definitely the de facto leader of the Federalist Party, even though by that point, John Adams was the President of the United States and who was a pseudo-federalist himself, but he really wasn't the leader of the party. It was Hamilton who led the party and who the major figures within the party looked to him for leadership in terms of what direction the country should take in terms of the different political issues of the day. In the election of 1800, Hamilton had opposed John Adams getting a second term in office, and uh, during that time he had also said some things about Aaron Burr that weren't particularly, uh, who was running for vice president under um, the Republican Party, with Jefferson being the main Republican figure who was running for president. And Burr took exception to those comments, a number of times of which Hamilton had made comments throughout their long dealings with one another over the course of probably 14 or 15 years. And finally, Burr had just had enough, and by 1804, uh, some word came back to him that Hamilton had made some untoward comments about Burr, and so Burr challenged Hamilton to a duel, and uh, they did indeed, which was something that was common for a gentleman of that time to settle their disputes of honor in the form of a duel, and so they did indeed meet on a duel in New York, and um, Burr shot Hamilton, and a few days later, Hamilton died from his wounds. So that brought to the end uh, of life for Hamilton, and when he was only in his later 40s. And so here was a man who was still very much a vital figure in U.S. history that was cut down in part by the sitting president of, vice president rather, of the United States. So really a pretty shocking end. Nothing ever happened to Burr. He was never tried for any crime and uh, he finished up his term in office and was uh, at, lived a free man for the rest of his life. Hamilton is a major figure. I hope you're 
interested in reading a little bit more about him, learning more about him, uh, this great book, Ron Chernow's Alexander Hamilton. Hope you found it interesting, and I will see you the next time. Bye.